the greetings of the day to one and all present here. Your career is your business and it's time to manage it as a CEO. With this, I, Harshita, along with my co-host, Mokshit Bahani, would like to extend my heartiest welcome to you all for joining us today. So Wings of Fire is a student-to-student -student assistance initiative and with the motive, Together We Learn, it was started back in February 2016 to help students to learn from each other. Here, we organize various webinars and workshops throughout the year to nurture the versatility of students and bring forth opportunities to learn skills that are generally omitted in college curriculum. So today, we are here with another session of our very own initiative, Man Ki Baat, Seniors Ke Saath. And the topic of the session is Breaking into Corporates, Finance and Consulting Edition. Here, we'll be discussing everything related to finance and consulting as a career option. Now, I would like Mokshit to continue with the session. Thank you, Harshita. So before we begin with today's much awaited session, it falls on me to formally introduce our esteemed panelists for today's finance and consulting roundtable. Besides being alumnus of SRCC and former members of Wings of Fire, both of them have two things in common, a stellar academic record and an enviable work experience. Our first guest of honor is Bhumika Shankla. She is a CA by profession and an incoming business associate at BCG. She also has varied articleship and industrial training experience at Deloitte and ABG respectively. She has eclectic interests and diverse skill sets ranging from cooking and reading to listening to podcasts, music and trying her hand at new things, urban sketching being one of her latest explorations. Her personal blog, The Hummingbird, features her curated book recommendations and even her unique newsletter, Five Things I Consumed Last Week, contains countless references to thought-provoking and intellectually stimulating literature. She has embodied the very spirit of striking the right balance by pursuing her passions and conducting counseling sessions alongside growing professionally in her career. Thank you, Bhumika, for joining us today. Pleasure. That was a very teasing introduction, Moksha. Thank you so much. Our next guest for today is Pranit Jain. He's presently an investment banking analyst at Rothschild. And after clearing his CA intermediate examination with exemptions in six out of eight subjects, he joined Nomura as an analyst in the global wholesale strategy division. Besides his rich experience at these much sought after companies, he was an active member of our college societies and proactively undertook internships in KPMG and Spark Capital Advisors while in college. On behalf of the entire team of Wings of Fire SRCC, I thank both of you for gracing today's session of Man Ki Baat Seniors Ke Saath with your August virtual presence and sparing your precious time to share nuggets of wisdom. So without further ado, I would now like to ask the first question, which has boggled many of us. So it is very common to see that people are inclined towards finance and consulting. So how did both of you realize that it was your calling? Bunga, do you I want think Pranit should go first. <laughs> no, you should go first. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right. So I think uh, to be very, very honest, I was as confused as most of the people are at college, right? 20 or 21 year olds just struggling to understand what actually consulting or finance is. And, you know, it's kind of uh, talking to a lot of people and understanding what does the job role entails and what kind of work will I be exposed to. So firstly, I think to, to kind of make a decision whether consulting or finance or any other thing that you want to really pursue. During those three years of college, you really need to undergo internships in different aspects or different fields to understand what is something that really excites you or interests you, which really helps you to kind of understand that probably this is something that I, I can probably do for two years, at least after college, right? So that is one of the very important factors for you to explore before getting into that job thing specifically. And then I think what worked for me or what was unique about my career uh, related decision was Earlier, I got placed with one of the consulting firms, obviously on the front end one, but uh, a, a mid-office role for one of the consulting firms. So 
but, but then namura opportunity came really late in the college and i was like why did i actually go for that opportunity was it was an investment bank but the role that it came for was sort of an in house consulting team to run their strategic projects or their corporate strategy so that kind of role i thought was the perfect balance of consulting and finance wherein i can actually look at consulting projects but in the finance domain so kind of making the best of both the worlds and that is what led me to kind of experience both of these domains in in my profile at namura and i think that's a very unique sort of a role but i i completely understand that that is not something which is available to a lot of people or you know such kind of roles are very limited in the market but i think irrespective of whatever finance or consulting you choose the core ingredients or the key ingredients are very very similar it's just the proportion of those ingredients change in one role versus the other but the core remains the same so either you start with finance or you start with consulting it's not really a big deal because ultimately two years down the line you will have certain kind of skill set which is very very fungible and can be kind of used irrespective of wherever you are i think pranit has given a very elaborative answer so um one of the key factors for me as well was to first experience it and then decide whatever i want to do finance was definitely an inclination and that's why i did cfa but then uh, when i was working with abg especially in their corporate strategy stint i kind of realized that this is my domain and because it is so diverse and multifunctional because what when you are working in corporate strategy you are looking at strategy but you are looking at other projects as well for example mergers and acquisitions for example business valuations etc so it's a very diverse profile and that i thought suited me better than any other role and that's why i chose consulting because when i was in abg i was like an internal consultant to the group which pranit also mentioned so similar role but uh, i wanted to explore it further and of course i mean consulting with the big giants is kind of a lot of exposure so yeah that's why i chose consulting easy <laughs> Okay, so from both of you, I can gain that both of you had a mix of both the finance and the consulting world. So, with respect to mm. Pranit, he was in a role where basically a financial consultancy sort of thing was involved, and in your case also, you were an internal consultant. But at the same time, there was corporate strategy involved. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So, the next follow-up question is: What skills do you feel provided you the necessary head start in both of your respective careers? Hmm. for me so i come from a ca background all right so for me it's going to be different than pranit for sure uh in my article ship most of my work was excel but when i was working in corporate strategy all of it was on powerpoint as in many industries so excel gave me a lot of edge because i think once you are into ca and once you are into article ship you are just working on excel day in and day out and so your hands become really like you become really really fast at excel which i don't see in a lot of mba ca- candidates no offense but yeah it comes with practice so head start was excel and um, definitely i think um, ipcc ca bcom whatever gives you a lot of uh, background in how financial statements work so once you're working in strategy or obviously looking if you're say doing competitor benchmarking etc you are looking at financials but then you need to understand what line items need to be compared to what are the line items so that kind of uh, core competency in understanding financial statements definitely gets you a lot of edge yeah but i think uh, very similar experiences uh, i think the core or the most important thing that you should really really learn in college is excel and powerpoint you should be extremely proficient with excel shortcuts and and you know powerpoint shortcuts how to just use all of those microsoft outlook tools with with keyboard shortcuts and not really use mouse so i think that really forms a part of how your first four or five months of your job are going to look like so you know to just give a perspective when you are at the bottom of the pyramid right out of the undergrad college a very few organizations are like most of the organizations at least initially will really not give you any kind of strategic or work that really requires you to think a lot from a strategic point of view so you are really into execution and to ensure that you are extremely good and efficient in 
at execution not just for the organization's benefit but also from your perspective like you know the more efficient you are the more time you have for yourself and le- lesser number of hours you have to spend at work so i think excellent powerpoint is like the holy grail that you should definitely ace during your college and i think apart from it i think something that you should really really uh, a skill that is very important is i think uh, being you know th- there should be no inhibition in talking to a lot of people or kind of creating or building relationships professional network with a lot of people i think that also takes you very long irrespective of whatever a uh, designation you are at so co- relationship building i think is also extremely important okay so three things which i could gauge from what both of you said is that firstly get your quote technicals right with respect to the financial statements and all the accounting that you are studying secondly have skill sets yep. in terms of the technical things like excel and powerpoint and at the same time you should be good at building networks and connections yeah okay and building like and working in teams basically so stakeholder management and communication basically yeah, yeah. okay uh, harshita would you like to continue with the session actually just yeah. wanted to add on some things uh, i i think uh, college projects also really help you with it but kind of having a uh, strong research skills able to find the right set mm-hmm. of data points or right set of information in the efficient possible time and also very strong written and verbal communication skills is also very very important definitely all right thank you for thank you for telling us the importance of all these things so i would like to ask the next question which is it's often advised to work in a finance or consulting role at the beginning of your career in commerce so is it true and if it is true then to what extent that's a tricky one <laughs> um okay see the first first very first point is um if you are getting a role it's good but if you are not so for a lot of people especially if you are in srcc i'm assuming most of people on this session would be um cracking a consulting role is not very easy so if you get in it's the best head start only and only because you get a lot of exposure if you are surrounded see a lot of your polishing will in the beginning of your career will depend on your company and the people you are surrounded by so the kind of company you join in matters a lot of course the role matters but if the role gives you enough exposure and diversity in terms of teaching you various aspects of how businesses work uh, that that's the that's the only thing i would look for at the starting yeah so i think i can possibly you know firstly irrespective of whatever kind of role you get as bhumika mentioned doesn't matter if you have the right skill set but i can also go and list on some of the things that really help you if you kind of are you know get into some of those very coveted roles right out of out of your undergrad degree so for example you know for example if you are into consulting or ib the doors for any sort of profile that you want to obviously apart from the text related profiles really open up to you a lot of people whether it's private equity or venture capital or corporate strategy or any startup ceo's office or corporate development sort of roles or for that matter any anything that is management or administrative in nature really opens up and they really value your ib or consulting experience because the kind of skills that you develop and the kind of grooming that these organizations or roles provide you is really really unmatchable like i'm not saying you can't really get that anywhere else but you definitely can but i think that's what uh, as in that is how industry looks at these roles uh, especially consulting and i banking so exits become a lot more easier so what these roles yeah. really provide you is the power of choice you can really choose what you really want to do after these kind of roles you want to stay in these these roles good enough if you don't want to the exit opportunities are immense like you can exit to any sort of profile versus probably you start with somewhere in a startup your exit options might be limited but i think obviously it's there but but they get limited because the market really does not look at those roles uh, as probably a right fit for what they really want so the power of choice that comes along with the, with these roles is something that makes them very special or makes them uh, you know the the competition around it is so huge because of this power of choice that these roles offer yeah and also brand value like 
so whatever you say your cv will only stand out because see it's the survival of the fittest so you need to do what you, you what you got to do and the harsh truth is brand values and brand names and roles matter they still do the degrees matter so if you have a good brand name plus a good profile it will open a lot of doors for you so that's the harsh truth but yeah that's what all right so basically roles do matter for cv and for your career but uh, to get exposure you should look for the fields where your interest lies right definitely yeah yeah that's that's the that's like the basic so there are like three filters the first filter will always always be where your interest is if you join something only for the sake of a brand value then after 6 months you will be burned out and then makes no sense so yeah Cool. All right. Thank you. Next. Okay. So, can you both of you give us a brief walkthrough of your preparation journey in your respective roles, and what did the interviews look like? All right, Pranit. Yeah. So, um, I'll start with how did it work for Namura, and then I'll also come to what it was at Rothschild. So, for Namura, uh, obviously, after the CV shortlisting, it was more like four rounds of interviews, more or less. So, it start m- most of the people. tend to interview like everybody in the team will interview you of sorts whether it's going to be a bigger panel or one one that depends but most of the at least team members from my team interviewed me uh, before my role at namura so you know in the initial to begin with it it starts with more like you know it can be for, for undergrad people it can be a mix of guesstimates or any kind of brain teaser questions or kind of a case study based questions and if you're looking at finance profile technicals of finance are extremely important you should be very very thorough with all of these concepts of finance like roe calculation roce how do the three statements work how do they combine together how do accounting like line items work what is going to be the impact of for example if uh, inventory uh, of uh, 10 million dollars is not recorded in the books of finance and then you discover that anomaly how will that impact the three statements so these kind of questions is something that you really really need to be very well prepared with to crack any finance interview then specifically for namura the role really involved a lot of macro economics uh, outlook so you really need to be thorough with uh, for example if interest rates increase how is that that going to impact the economy or for that matter investment banking business in general uh, how is money supply impacting uh, different different other mac- macroeconomic factors how does that bake in uh, for example if us uh, fed one day decides to slash their interest rates how is that going to impact india business or indian markets so macroeconomics is again something that was really in focus especially from a namura standpoint and then uh, a lot of interviews also kind of give you case studies to solve uh, at undergrad level they might be limited but once you want to move from one job to another case studies are a very important part of how do you want to uh, kind of crack the other one not like a typical consulting interview kind of a case study which is verbal more like they'll give you a company and for example a problem statement that morgan stanley is facing issues with the india business uh, how can they transform it so you have to prepare like an eight pager deck on what do you think about uh, that can be their co- corporate or transformation strategy to realign their business in india so this obviously is not really very popular right out of the undergrad placement but once you are in job and have some work experience this kind of case study really is there in most of the uh, interview rounds then uh, i think for ib there are typically uh, five to seven rounds of interviews post cv shortlisting initially uh, for the first two to three rounds the juniors and the associates or the analyst interview you so they really grill you on all the financial technicals like they ask you discounted cash flow analysis they ask you how do you value companies the gordon growth dividend model and all the basic concepts of finance you should be very very thorough with it and uh, the uh, later rounds of interviews which are with senior people really focus on assessing whether you are right fit for the organization or not so probably you can get kind of question like especially like i got this question that you know that investment bankers have to work like 17 hours a day why do you want such a miserable life for yourself why don't you do consulting or why don't you do a corporate strategy role where you're coming from why do you want to subscribe to you know so much of so so you should really also prepare for what is the politically correct answer for these kind of hr questions or tricky questions that might 
get get get, get you you might land up in at the senior level so it it has to be a really mix of balance but i think technicals there should not be a single hiccup if you want to really crack finance not even a single hiccup you can afford yep i think very very similar experiences so answers are also very similar for me also when i was applying for a, for the corporate strategy role my interview majorly revolved around industry knowledge by industry knowledge i mean how, suppose how the logistics sector is doing in india if you are if you want to invest in india which sector would you invest in so basically knowing how different industries are working and especially now because now you have spin tech you have consumer tech so you have plus tech everywhere so you need to be very thorough with that part of it that that part as well all the contemporary topics even if you don't like even if you don't understand nft properly which i still don't like some parts of bitcoin i still don't understand but then you have to be okay enough to at least start and initiate the discussion so that's all uh for both the roles again i was asked about my work experience so once you have like a decent two or three year work ex then you should be able to explain them very thoroughly what you did so do you don't have to give them a job description of what happens in your job but what specifically you were able to perform well in the job and what difficulties you faced so say if i worked on a financial model the, the person asked me what was the most difficult part of the ma- model because a lot of people just state things in the cv and which they are not very sure about so it clearly shows whenever you are speaking about it so you have to be thoda smart of whatever you are putting also because that is going to guide how the interview is going to go so the work experience then of course there are case studies there are economic statistics there is investment and finance so you need to be very sure of the terms that pranit mentioned you need to be sure about what is the difference between like irr equity irr all the things about cash flow management etc so especially like if it's a finance role then you can't just you can't be mediocre you have to be very thorough with you they can ask you very basic things like what is yield if yield uh Uh, the yield rate changes this and that then what happens in the bond market you need to be very sure of the fixed how the fixed income part works etc so that is there then there can be contemporary topics anything so whatever is going on in the industry whatever is going on in the economy whatever parlances and differences are there between india us china equation you need to be sure about that so that is there uh in my bcg interview it was majorly um, guesstimates and case prep so not even guesstimates but to some people they do ask estimates uh so it was majorly case interview and uh, for case interview they uh, a lot of buddy which is like one month before the interview so it's a very long process every week we used to like practice around two cases with my buddy and then we all the shortlisted candidates used to practice cases amongst each other so most of the books are available online these are case books by uh, iims isb srcc also has one so all these books uh, you need to form your own case structure on how are you going to go about say a profitability case or an mna case so case prep is the major deal but with case prep you have to complement it with decent enough industry knowledge so they can there can be two type of cases there can be open ended cases like uh, suppose a bank wants to increase their disbursement so the that was the case that was asked to me and the answer the the way we reached out to that answer was basically neo banking so uh, things like that so industry knowledge plus basic structure of cases so were the things yeah i think yeah that's most of it okay so basically the static technicals which are static in the finance field be it in terms of the discounted cash flow models or the yield curves and how mm. to understand them you should have a comprehensive clarity about that and at the same time the yeah. dynamic thing things you should also be abreast about it yeah 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 so next question we have is why do you think pursuing a career in consulting gives an upper edge instead of other career options so <laughs> i don't want to look down of on other careers but see for me i think why consulting is such a fancy job for a lot of candidates especially people who want to join right after college is because it gives you a lot of traveling uh, why where you are just you know traveling places every week so that is there but from an adult perspective this was this was lucrative to me when i was in college but after like once you are 24 25 you're like no i can't like i can't do this i can't travel every week so it looks lucrative from the other hand because grass is greener on the other side but once you are 
a little settled in life you would not want to travel a lot that's the con that i am stating the pros are definitely being surrounded for me it was just the company when i was in abg i was surrounded by only people from iims not to say that people from other institutes are not good enough but of course good institutes are good for a reason so the kind of people that you work with will help you grow a lot in terms of your personal development so i think company makes the difference and of course because these are big companies so the clients that they deal with are also big so the problems that you deal the exposure that you get the projects you work on are definitely better than other options so yeah that's all okay uh, so uh, this is a special uh, question specifically for pranit so what does the general deal pipeline look like in investment banking what are the steps and apart from the deals what are the day to day roles and responsibilities of the work right so i think um, investment banks typically look at kind of two two kind of deals especially from a deal perspective i'm talking about one is the sell side deal wherein you are running a sell side mandate something like an existing investor wants to sell its stake in the in one of the their portfolio companies and you are kind of looking uh, you you are their financial advisor and looking for a potential buyer that is a sell side deal or a primary fundraiser example a company wants to raise a fresh ra- round of growth capital or something of that sort that is like a typical sell side deal then there's a buy side deal wherein some of the private equity firms appoint bankers to help them evaluate whether this is the right uh you know analyze and evaluate whether it's a, uh, any company that they've received or any opportunity that they might have in mind is a right investment to make or not and what is the right valuation that they should bid that investment for so these are typically the two kind of deals especially in the m&a or advisory practice that rothschild does is uh, are the two kind of major deals that are there the sell side deals are generally longer they range from 5 to 7 months and what do, do the typical involve is usually they begin with a pitch wherein you pitch to that client that you know that these are the credentials that we have in this sector or this space or this geography and you should appoint us as your banker to fetch you the best valuation or fetch you or or to help you access the right pockets of capital and then once you get that deal you start with you you know you uh, interact a lot with the client try to understand their company and their business and then start preparing the marketing materials or as they're called in the ib parlance so collaterals uh, which kind of usually takes a month's time for you to uh, uh, make this uh, collaterals after uh, collateral preparation then you identify a list of investors that you will want to initially reach out to you so you do a lot of investor reach outs and kind of gauge interest from the investors whether they are looking to invest in this particular kind of a uh, a uh, sector or this particular kind of a company or not after signing of nda which is non disclosure agreements once uh, the investors are uh, you know sign the ndas you give them uh, the collaterals that you have prepared as their banker and give them some time to evaluate that company uh, and whether you know to form an opinion whether they want to invest in that company or not or you know how do they look at that company and during this period of time you get a lot of questions asked on the company's business or financials that you have to coordinate with your client which is the selling company or the selling shareholders and once uh, investors kind of have made up their mind they help uh, or they give out non binding offers which basically means that they tell whether that they want to invest in this company at this valuation and want to buy xx percentage of stake in there and there are a lot of nuances to it and nuances to it for example some investors might want to buy a controlling stake whereas some investors might want to buy a minority stake so based is what the non binding offers that are received by the potential buyers the client and you along as in the banker decide that these are the buyers that you want to proceed ahead with in the process so out for example if you've received 10 uh, non binding offers you shortlist four out of them and proceed ahead with the process and once that shortlisting is done then you go ahead with due diligence so all the investors will do due diligence they might hire external consultants like bcg or ew ew pwc etc to do due diligence commercial due diligence financial due diligence a taxation due diligence etc to understand the company better and whether it's a right decision to make or not or whether there are any uh, possible red flags with the company or not and then once that is done then they finally give out a binding offer or all the investors that are willing to kind of uh, invest in that company 
and then whoever gives the best valuation or whoever example the client wants to get funding from or wants to sell it to there then decide it and then the agreement gets signed that is like a typical sell side deal process from a buy side as i mentioned in the sell side process the first two months are in the collateral preparation and all of that thing comes the buy side starts with once you have received the collateral from the sell side bank and you evaluate on that investors behalf that how do you want to invest in that company or evaluate what is the right valuation for that company then the due diligence all of that you do from the from from the buyer's perspective and not from the seller's perspective so that is the other side of the table that ibs generally do uh and then what are the other things that really are there in that a typical investment banking role is so uh you also do a lot of marketing or pitching as you say so you have to maintain a lot of client relationships with all these big funds or all of these sellers so you have uh, for example most of the i banks operate like there are different pools or different sectors that the teams are divided in so for example i look at technology and business services practice so i need to be very very thorough with that sector have it should be abreast with whatever is happening in that sector what are the new trends what are the active investors what are the potential opportunities that we can really pitch to so you have to prepare a lot of marketing decks a lot of pitches uh, a lot of you know discussion materials a lot of company profiles which can be potential opportunities for your mds to go and discuss about so that is uh, the other side of ib that is more or less there okay uh, so just a follow up question you emphasize about the importance of valuations in both the sell side and the buy side deals right yeah so when we are having up and coming businesses bhumika also mentioned about contemporary things like bitcoin and nft and all that so they are very much intangible so isn't there too much conflict involved in different valuation models so i think uh, how do you re- only value those kind of businesses might not just be financial related valuation so uh, some different businesses will have very different financial models for example logistics business will be based on how many warehouses do you have what is the maturity cohort of that warehouse how do you kind of project uh, you know increase in space or what is the average revenue that a particular warehouse or particular square feet of space generates versus a uh, hospital business or like a uh business here in the revenue model is primarily based on the number of beds etc so for example for this tech businesses you use different kind of matrices or valuation methodologies to look at valuation for example you might look at uh, ev by users or you might look at uh, for example what is the market capitalization or what is the trading volume for example if it's a bitcoin trading company what is the trading volumes what is the uh, what do we say the uh uh the the gap or the interest or the the commission that you charge for every bitcoin traded and you arrive at valuations basis those kind of things and how do you uh for example project uh, what do we say the volume that is going to be there on your exchanges so you see for example binance started 5 years ago what has been their historical trend of volumes how has that grown and compare it with something like an indian exchange like coin d6 etc and and kind of do a lot of peer benchmarking to arrive at these softer aspects of valuation apart from the financial aspects of things yeah i think valuation is a very subjective thing like you can't have one financial model for everything right. basically it will depend on what is the revenue model of the company so once you like once you crack the basic uh, variants which are driving the revenue and then you can either take up your benchmarking or and then make some additions or deletions from the multiple or else you can do a basic like if there has been a deal with the same investor before so then you can take that as a benchmark there are different methods to do it but again it will depend on case to case basis so yeah So I can also elaborate a little bit on valuation. So primarily, you use three kind of valuation techniques. One is trading comps, which is you look at the most similar uh, listed companies and see what trading multiples like PE or PEG ratio or even by beta ratio that they are trading at to kind of get a sense that this is what market looks like. Then you kind of do transaction comps, which is basically in the similar sector of a similar companies, what has been the deal cycle or the deals that have happened in the past and valuation multiples or at what valuations have those deals been done that give you kind of a range of uh, what is the valuation that you can probably arrive at and then third part is the intrinsic valuation of the company wherein you actually get into the modeling bit and 
uh, arrive at the intrinsic value of the company then you prepare a football field chart typically wherein you see that from trading comps this is the valuation range that i get from transaction comps this is the valuation range that i get from the intrinsic value like dcf modeling this is the uh, valuation range I, i i get and then you kind of arrive at median or average or something of that sort to arrive at the right valuation of a company G- generally that is what the valuation process is okay so basically from the con- apart from the quantitative technicals a certain degree of subjective judgment is also involved on the part of the valuer absolutely okay, so yeah. the next yeah so the next question we have is the most prominent downside observed is the lack of healthy work life balance so how much of that is true 100% true <laughs> no doubt about it <laughs> I don't know what to say in that. I mean, obviously, see, life itself is a trade-off. So you need to make certain choices in order to avoid certain choices. As simple as that. Of course, uh, companies now have become very vigilant about maintaining a good work life. But see, it a lot of it depends on your team. A lot of it depends on your manager, on your colleagues if they are supporting enough. And of course, if you can prioritize things better, or uh, uh, whatever. See, there is no principle, or there is nothing that I can tell you. If you are joining as a fresher, I will just tell you that you need to, at all times, prioritize your physical and mental health above anyone else. So, yeah, that's all. And like from my perspective, as an I really come from an IB sort of background. So, like as Bhumika mentioned, it's cent per cent true, and and. just to put in context there are good days and there are bad days on bad days for yep. example if your your live deal is going on you might have to stretch out till 4 am or 5 am in the morning because you want to deliver a client and you can't really slack off you can't say that i will not work till 4 am because the client is asked for it and you need to do it irrespective of whatever is there right so there are bad days and then there are good days for example when uh, the deal is kind of in in a phase wherein you sent out the collaterals then there's a cool off period wherein you can kind of relax a bit and there is not a lot of work so mm. there are good days and bad days and then i, I as bhumika mentioned that it, it's a trade off game so i think it's a relationship there's a direct relationship between the kind of uh, money that you want to make and the time that you have to spend so <laughs> time is a commodity look at it as a commodity yeah. you're paying a price Uh, for the time that you spend, and as in you're getting something in return for it, so you have to yeah. look at it from that perspective. You might want a healthier work-life balance, but obviously you can't expect that you you'll get the best pay package that is there. So there's always g- going to be this decision choice that you have to make for yourself. Definitely. Okay. okay so basically, uh, to maintain a proper healthy work-life balance, one needs to know how to prioritize things, right? and also yep. as as pranit mentioned that there are good and as well as bad days so yeah. yeah thank you for this answer also uh, as pranit mentioned i was reminded that i read it somewhere that uh, investment banking is like a marathon with multiple sprints <laughs> <laughs> that is definitely true so especially for our team it's not like you're always for example this one deal going on and you're only working on that deal you work on multiple like mm-hmm. couple of deals together as well so one day you're working on one deal the other day you're working on the other deal because those deals are going in parallel and obviously there's a short sprint so a deal generally closes out in like 5 to 7 months right so once that is done you'll get another deal and you'll have to run that sprint again and then the one that once that deal closes you have to like move on with the other deal so it's a part of the the job profile that you've subscribed for and uh, i think since uh, it it also works in uh, sector fashion or pool fashion especially in the i banking zone you also over time kind of develop a lot of sector expertise and then you become a lot more efficient once you've started to look at a lot of companies at that sector you become more efficient so with efficiency obviously the kind of hours that you need to, need to put in also reduces but that happens over time Okay, so earlier we had touched upon uh, the importance of having good communication skills, be it verbal or written. And even Pranit also mentioned that even in investment banking, you have to build parallel pitch decks where you present ideas and where you present investment prospects. So a question to Bhumika that 
what do you think was the importance of storytelling and communication in cracking the consulting jobs hmm. and how did college activities and blogging which you do help you in it yeah i think it matters a lot college society specifically helped me because even in wings when we were working we were definitely making presentation obviously not as good as the ones that i make right now but yeah decent enough so uh, yeah i think these kind of skills definitely help you because once you are so once i entered abg my focus shifted from excel to ppt i still had a decent enough pick on what should the color profile look like how should the alignment be what should i bold what should i not bold things like that and it makes a lot of difference because you can clearly see the difference between someone who has not gone to college and someone who has gone to college and worked in societies there's a difference in how they communicate as well i can definitely identify people uh, if they are from college or not from college on the basis of the mails that they send out so the kind of respect the kind of politeness that you showcase in your emails reflects a lot of things about you as a person so those are the softer skills that you develop once you're working in societies etc in blogging specifically my writing improved a lot because once if i'm writing something if i am say recommending five things a week i am definitely reading 20 and then i'm shortlisting them to 50 so uh, reading uh, speed uh, improved a lot i was reading multiple things at a certain point of time which and reading is like a superpower because it gives you a lot of perspective in a lot of things so once you are reading a lot you are definitely improving on your writing you are definitely improving on your vocabulary your knowledge base your uh, perspective widens a lot in terms of thinking from uh, and thinking from other person's uh, mindset and putting your putting yourself in other person's shoes so say if i'm listening to a podcast i recently listened to this podcast on the scene and the unseen about the life of a indian muslim and i had never thought of it that way like what would be the perspective of a person who is a muslim in this country especially being a minority muslim in a country like india and it it opened my eyes so you know that kind of helps you also a very underrated thing but that kind of helps you being an interesting interesting person when you are at a party or you're just conversing or making friends in office right you can't be a boring person once you are surrounded by a lot of people so yeah that's there yeah definitely yep. i can relate to that that it gives you a lot of talking points and as you said mm. that it gives you a lot of perspective also so just to share in mm. one of the interviews which we had for our internship season i was able to answer yeah. a few questions because i had read something out of the syllabus and at the same time yeah. when they gave follow up questions i was not able to answer because i had not read enough <laughs> yeah interesting yeah that kind of a debate i think goes on to that the short form versus long form content thing as well so if you are reading but you are not reading in depth then it's just surface level knowledge which i suffered a lot last year and this year i only read a lot of long form articles just to gain enough perspective is fine you can just if you are just giving your opinion without any backing or research or reasoning then you're just blabbering things without any uh, statistics so that's not yeah that that shouldn't happen all right now we have a general question so how do you guys as individuals try to maintain your mental health okay pranit you go first <laughs> so i think uh, what has really helped me or like how do i approach it is i have i have a core group of people it can be friends it can be family it can be your cousins it can be anyone right but you need to be very very comfortable with them and you should be in a position to vent out whatever you feel whenever kind of you approach that ab mujhse nahi ho pa raha hai as simple as that so mm-hmm. there are some days that i i'm like what have i done to myself this is not something that i really can do for long or you know you get all all all, all kind of things or thoughts in your mind so you really really need to have that core group of people where you can talk about it and kind of let mm-hmm. it out of your system and that letting out process really helps you to be at peace with what you're doing and i mm-hmm. think uh, more or less how it also works is you try to also maintain like cordial relationships or have some 
you know colleague besties or work 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 related besties and you can actually share discuss about projects or kind of just have a small talk whenever you feel like or go for a quick coffee break so that also really helps you to kind of stay sane during extreme working hours or you know very critical time sensitive projects when it's it's all just in a chaos so that also really helps for you so so having a core group of people and second having at least one friend who is very you know close to you in your workplace i think these are the two things that have really helped me yeah i think so mental health again is a very wide subject to talk about but of course you need to have a venting buddy where you can you know bitch about anyone you want so that that definitely helps i agree personally i think uh, a lot of uh, things now depend on if you are a anxious person or not i used to be a very i am still a very anxious person and i get frazzled very easily if something is not working in my code but um, in terms of uh, definitely thinking more about my emotions and why do i re- react the way i react identifying your attachment styles whether you are an anxious attachment person whether you are secure about your relationships or not so i think it's a lot of it the journey is all about understanding who you are as a person and uh, i think journaling personal journaling helped me a lot it might sound woodooish but of course meditation and yoga helps it strengthens your focus and your strength as a person so yeah that's that's that and i guess okay, so, sorry uh, I, one thing that i also am able to recall is what i used to do was to initially begin with like i was in a place where i was like very difficult the first two months were extremely difficult for me so i used to kind of break it down like that i need to get to the end of this day not worry about that i have a lot of work or a lot of things to do the next day just break it down day by day and take it like that and then you will you'll get used to that process definitely and it's basically what i understood is uh, having right set of people is important with whom you can share your feelings out right okay so yeah. i also have a follow up question regarding that also so to what extent will your organization help you to keep your mental health safe oh my god very tricky see um organizations now have a very flexible policy which especially the so when i was in abg they were very flexible about working from home if i have to say visit a doctor or do my own things i can personally reach out to them and they are very flexible in understanding your priorities so that is there an organization can only help you to a certain extent is what i feel obviously there can be flexible policies there can be more so in bcg we have this thing where after every project you are asked about your experience on that project and if you are not getting enough time to work on other things you can definitely reach out to your team and they will help you but um, they can only be there to an extent you need to be there for yourself after a point so yeah yeah that's all that's what i have to say uh i think totally agree with bhumika i think you should not really have any expectations from your workplace <laughs> you seem so disappointed pranit <laughs> no no i it's it's an industry wide practice uh, across investment yeah. banking uh, investment mm. banking profile by its nature is something very harsh and not just i banking finance in general is very harsh people are very Definitely. transactional because they are yeah. ultimately doing transactions at the end of the day people are very transactional it's quid pro quo and people you know mm. they will try to pamper you with all the luxury that is that you know they'll take you to off sites they'll take take you for vacations like bcg yeah. has this project off site kind of a thing that they do a lot, yeah. like i think couple of times in a year or something or you know they'll help mm. you with a, a, a chauffeur driven car or probably they'll they'll give you access to the best of food but that is what their approach to you know kind of pamper you with the kind of efforts that you're putting in but from from a mental health perspective i think the kind of kick or the kind of experience that you have is very very different and, and i think you would really need to solve it for yourself versus somebody else solving it for you so you need to prioritize you need mm. to understand that what kind of relaxes you so for example having a hobby at the end of the day makes you know having a me time to pursue hobby kind of relaxes you and that you need to decide for yourself what can be done and 
having an expectation from an organization i don't think so you should really have it because at the end of the day it's that is not what they are really concerned about definitely yep so we have a few questions from youtube as well so if you guys could spare a few minutes can we take that up yes yeah okay so uh, the first question which we have is what are your views on jack of all and master of none is this approach good to make it into ib or consulting it is i don't know if a lot of so i don't know a lot of people don't know about the whole saying is what i have noticed so it's the, the whole saying is jack of all trades master of none but still a master of some or something like that if i'm not so basically the essence is what i feel you need to be multi potentialite in today's world no matter if you are in finance you need to still be able to understand industry wide things very 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 minutely so being a multi potentialite and especially in this hustle culture it's it's a no brainer like you have to be a jack of all trades is what i feel i think it's very similar experience i think you need to know about a lot of things but obviously you need to kind of develop a niche for mm. yourself for you to excel in any kind of yeah practice that you are but obviously you can't just ignore the other facets of things so create a niche for yourself yeah. but definitely be aware of what's happening around the world okay so basically have a breadth of skill sets and a certain mm. degree of depth in your core competency Okay. We have one more question on YouTube. So, what do you guys think are the PE exit opportunities from investment banking and consulting? I think we have discussed it. Like there are immense opportunities. Especially, I know people who join consulting, and I don't know about IB, but there are definitely people who join consulting only to take an exit to a PE or a VC. So that is there. There are obviously people who, like, in the beginning of your career, you can't expect Sequoia to hire you without any work ex or without any degree. So that's not going to happen. So you take an eventual process where you have worked with a couple of organizations and then you take an exit so consulting is the best way to do that but of course you can also probably start with smaller vcs that are there in delhi bombay whatever and then you can probably make an exit to a larger pe or a vc firm so the opportunities are immense is what i know i kind of have a slightly different view on this so mm. the pe and vc is something like consultants or i bankers really want to get into the overall opportunities especially from an indian context at max every year there are just probably 35 or 40 roles span in india open to all the it teams open to all the like you know people from all the great colleges or whatever right and yeah. there's a pool of some 500 600 consultants across mbb then there's a pool of some 100 or like 80 90 100 i bankers from all the global banks so to get those 35 roles you are competing mm. against against a pool of some 600 700 people so if you realistically calculate the probability the probability of you cracking it is very less i'm not saying people yeah. haven't made it people definitely have made it and the pool is this consulting or i banking or some product experts like uh you know people have really worked in a startup and know that saas product extremely well so more or less these are the three broader categories of people that actually p or vc is demand but the number of roles that are there are extremely limited like you getting there probably you are in the top 35 of india mm. and you need to be yeah. very clear of this you should not join consulting because you want to make a pe exit because the probability of you making that pe exit is very less hmm. the hope is really high but yeah i agree yeah definitely so if you want to be in the cream of the cream then uh, of course there is a lot of competition that's it but of course there is hope as well yeah and yeah i i am not of the opinion that you should only join because you want to make an exit to a pe or vc but 
yeah, if you want to, the pool is consulting IB slash product managers slash some someone who has worked in the startup area for a long period of time. Yeah. Okay. So uh, now I'd like to hand over to Harshita to conclude today's session. Yeah. So with this, we are uh, officially over the, for today's session. And it was a great session. We got a lot of insights from you, from your experiences, from your working experience, from mental health and many more. So it was a great session. Uh, I would like to thank you both for taking out your precious time for the session and guiding us. It was great talking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, guys, for organizing this. Pleasure. Yeah. Thanks, guys. I hope you kind of... Thank you. You know, we, we, we would have some value add to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Especially on a weekend. Yeah. I hope we did. We did, we did not bore you a lot, but... Yeah. <laughs> yes, we really appreciate the nuance that you all presented in your answers. Yeah.